Hello, APWU. Can we hear it for Mark out here? You all have elected a phenomenal, phenomenal union president with Mark right over here. He deserves all the flowers in the world uh, because he's a fighter. And it speaks so much to the character of this union and each and every one of you all for have selecting the leaders that you have selected here to fight, to preserve, protect, and expand the United States Postal Service and the rights of all APW workers across the United States of America. So thank you, thank you all so much. I also would like uh, to thank um, our AFL-CIO president, Elizabeth Schuler, the first woman to represent the, the nation's largest federation of unions in the United States. And of course, coming from the Bronx and Queens, I have to give a shout out to our locals out here. Thank you to APWU's uh, Jonathan Smith for the New York metro area. Thank you to our Flushing local president, Lillian Pascal. Thank you to our Long Island City LIC back home, Christopher Becerra, and our Queens area local president, Ron Suslak, um, as well as all of our local presidents here today. Thank you so, so, so much for, for all of the work that you do and ensuring that we have an organized grassroots uh, union labor movement within our postal services. And I can tell you that, that they all are out there on the ground putting in the work. As Mark mentioned earlier uh, in, in his remarks, just a few months ago, they were, and our postal workers were out in the cold collecting petitions to qualify pro union, pro postal service uh, representatives all across the ballot earlier, or just a few months ago. I wouldn't be on the ballot in New York State if it wasn't for APWU workers. So I want to thank you all so very much. Because it's not just about showing up and convening, but it's about doing that gritty work on the ground, in the doors, having those conversations, growing the union, recruiting others, signing petitions. That is the work of change. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. Lastly, of course, again, I want to thank each and every one of you all of our postal workers across the United States, not just for the work that you do every day, but for saving our democracy. You saved our democracy. And that is no small feat. You saved our elections by processing millions of mail-in ballots in 2020 through today, Despite impossibly hostile conditions, you did that. You saved our presidential elections. You all saved countless lives and livelihoods during a global pandemic with your work, with your delivery services, by allowing people to stay home when needed and preventing unnecessary spread. People are alive today because of you. Thank you. You've also saved untold small businesses and mom and pops who also relied on the affordable public service that is the United States Postal Service powered by you. You all saved countless mom and pops because of the work that you did that rely on your affordable services so they can feed their kids too. You did that. Thank you. You all did that and you all do that. And every single day you prove that what other people call impossible is just another day on the job. And far too often, People throw around this word impossible. They throw around this word can't, cannot. But I think we need to really revisit this word impossible. We really need to revisit what we deem possible in this moment. 
because we have had a dramatic realignment in American society behind the power of the union and the union worker. We have had unprecedented levels of approval and popularity and education amongst the American public in support of union workers. We have seen an explosion of wildcat strikes and organized strikes alike, solidifying the power of solidarity and collective action in advancing workers' rights, elevating pay, uh, and, and continuing the dignity of the worker. What was impossible a year or two ago is now possible today. And it is important that we recognize that. Because far too many people use the word impossible to signify what is really just a lack of political will and political imagination. And we reject that. You all do what many call impossible every day. You provide a universal, self-sustaining, affordable public service available and guaranteed to every person in the United States with a strong and dignified labor union force. You all do that. We must appreciate that. Because if someone were to propose it today, pundits from every corner and both parties would call it naive, call it impossible. But you all do it. And yet here we are, 17.7 million pieces of mail processed every hour. Nearly half a billion pieces of mail you all process every day in this country. 13.2 billion holiday mail pieces shipped in 2021 alone. 46% of all the world's mail is processed and originates with you all, with this union, with these workers. Watch us work. And that, brothers and sisters and siblings, is why there is no other place I would rather be here today than, I'd rather be today than right here with you all. Because this is not a room where we endlessly discuss what can't be done. This is not a room where we endlessly discuss what what we cannot accomplish or what is impossible. This is a room where we figure out how to achieve the impossible. That's what this room is. That's what this union is. That's what this moment is. And in fact, you all have already begun, and together we have already begun. When I was first elected, they said saving the USPS was impossible. It was shackled by, by pre-funding mandates and billions of unnecessary needless debt because of Congress, not through any fault of the United States Postal Service. And the gridlock in Congress made the odds of passing a solution seem slim to none. They said it was impossible. But as a member of the House Oversight Committee, and seeing and together with the testimony and organizing from you all, the testimony from, uh, in, from into the House uh, Oversight Committee with, with Mark Dimenstein, with President Dimenstein, we just said, we're gonna start anyway. We're gonna try anyway. And what happened? We introduced the Postal, for, uh, the Postal Service Reform Act in 2021. We kept at it for a year when people said it was impossible, when vacancies in Congress brought these margins as slim to two, three, four votes. We kept going. They said, give up. It's not going to happen. We kept going. And what happened? On April 6, President Biden signed it into law, officially ending the pre-funding mandate, wiping out 85% of debt, saving $27 billion over 10 years. Don't tell us what is impossible. It is all possible 
When we join together in collective action and solidarity with one another, it is all possible when we realize that there is power in a union and that the power in this country is not in Capitol Hill, but it is in union halls and it is in conventions like these and it is in our neighborhoods and it is in ballot collecting and petition signing. That's where the true power is in this country. They said quitting any they said uh, getting any progress on all, at all, at all, on postal banking would be impossible. That the influence of big bank lobbyists were just too powerful to overcome. And I have seen them up close and personal. Well, last year, myself, alongside, alongside representatives Bill Pascrell of New Jersey, Marcy Kaptur of Ohio, along with our Senate partners, Kirsten Gillibrand of New York and Bernie Sanders of Vermont. We quietly, very quietly, funded four small postal banking pilot programs across the United States. <laughs> Slipped it in there. It is so small, so tiny, that most may not even notice it. And most may say it's too small, it's not gonna get us anywhere. But we know that those four pilots are our mustard seeds. They are our mustard seeds because they will bloom into a national revival of the national postal banking system in the United States. I know it will. I know you will make it happen. I know we as a country will make it happen. There are too many people who need it. Nearly 30% of Americans do not have access to affordable financial services, and you all will provide it to them. I know we will get there. I know we will. Impossible is nothing. And when the naysayer said it was too late to update our fleet, just this Friday, we passed historic legislation that, among other things, provides $3 billion for an electric fleet for the United States Postal Service. They said it was impossible. When they say it's impossible, we say, watch us work. When they say it's impossible, we say, what is it? Watch us work. This is the room where we achieve the impossible, because together, workers achieve the impossible. So if that's what we've done so far, what is our path ahead? Well, recently, Postmaster DeJoy, you said it, not me, indicated his plans to lay off 50,000 postal workers over the next several years. But we're here to say that that's not gonna happen. And we're not here just to protect workers from layoffs. The reason it's not gonna happen is because we're gonna have to, dr have to dramatically expand the United States Postal Service in the next 10 years. We're gonna have to ha add thousands of workers who can help us expand and provide and establish because now is the time to revive the national postal banking system in the United States of America. Now is the time. Now we are going to mobilize. Now we're going to get it done. Nearly Nearly 30% of Americans don't have access to affordable financial services, but we know that this could be a potential source of over $9 billion from the Inspector General's assessment, $9 billion of revenue for the United States Postal Service. This union is at the forefront of advancing civil society, American democracy, and protection from the climate crisis. It's APWU right here, this room, this union, this moment. We must work to elect a House and Senate that will pass the PRO Act and to increase national union density to go after union busting and to give the working class the tools to build power on an unprecedented level in the United States.
We're going to take that $3 billion signed on Friday, and we are going to make the United States Postal Service the prominent federal agency as the tip of the spear in implementing solutions to the climate crisis. That's APWU, and that's the USPS. And in the long run, we are not going to stop until we guarantee health care to every person in the United States of America. We're going to improve Medicare, we're going to expand Medicare, and we're going to bring everybody into Medicare. And these are tall orders. But these but tall orders are necessary in unprecedented times. Because the alternative of not doing them, of not pursuing them, is far more extreme than the ambition of accomplishing our goals. Nothing is far more extreme than accomplishing all that we dream of. And I need us to really understand that. Because for so long, doing too little or doing nothing at all was always branded as this reasonable, pragmatic approach. But there is nothing pragmatic about doing nothing when our cities are being flooded underwater. There is nothing that is, that is sober or clear-eyed by allowing companies to, to union bust. There is nothing sensical about not raising the minimum wage in the United States of America. These, those are extreme decisions. The common sense thing to do is to fight for working people. That is the common sense thing to do, and to do it courageously and bravely and sometimes aggressively. I find APWU one of the most inspiring unions in the United States. I truly do, and I'm not just saying that. I really do. And I find it so inspiring from the jump, from the get-go. This union was founded and has roots in the largest wildcat strike in American history. That's APWU. That's the soul of this union. The soul of this union is don't tell us no. This wildcat strike started, it was illegal, sure. But then what happened? President Nixon's administration, after the strike started, didn't know what to do. Because the public was so supportive of you all that they couldn't prosecute, they couldn't enforce. Because the services that you all do and the way that you all fight for working people means working people will fight for you against any power, no amount of money, no amount of stature, no amount of, of office or title can overcome the power of an ethical, strong, grassroots, democratic union, one like yours, that provides a federal, affordable, public service unlike any other scene in the world. And so where do we start? And it starts with the brass tacks. A lot of times people will say, Congresswoman, what do we do in this moment? And they think it's some big, grand solution. But it's always about the fundamentals. The fundamentals is how we accomplish the impossible. Just a few years ago, when we unseated a 20-term incumbent, outspent 10 to 1, I had no money, no political connections, none of that. How did we win? Nothing grand. The fundamentals. Knocking on doors talking to people, having conversations, understanding that the first and primary work is expansion. And you all have already started that process. There was a pledge drive to ex and, a, and a recruitment drive in this union to add 5,000 workers. You all accomplished that in about four weeks. Four weeks. Watch you work. So the first thing that we need to do 
is start joining our collective action teams right here in APWU and making sure that we start having conversations with workers who may not be union and telling them about the benefits and telling them about the community and the importance and the solidarity and the, and the power of collective action. Talk to your kids about why you're in a union. It's really incredibly important because there is power in a union. We all also are in the work of protecting our democracy. You all and your support for the For the People Act has been incredibly important in making sure that we build momentum in combating gerrymandering, ending the filibuster, and expanding the right to vote. The, and, and also, when it comes to uh, combating combating poverty in the United States. As Danny Glover said here a few years ago, quoting himself Martin Luther King, the first and greatest anti-poverty program is a union. And expanding union participation is incredibly important to elevating the dignity of all people in the United States. We are at a critical crossroads of theocracy and fascism. And the identities and solidarity across difference is what is going to save us. This isn't about ignoring our differences. It is about honoring them, celebrating them, cherishing them, and cherishing one another as equal. That means fighting for our white working class brothers and sisters. That means fighting for our black working class brothers and sisters it, 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 when their right to vote is under attack. That means fighting for the right to choice and abortion and health care. That means combating white supremacy where we see it. That means speaking up, speaking out, being in the streets, speaking to one another, because democracy is not just about elections. It is about the full, equal, and dignified participation in a free society, not just electorally, but economically, culturally, and civically. That is what democracy is all about. Democracy is not just about election day. It's about your union hall. It's about your conversations. It's about petitions. And it's about what we're able to pass. And that's why you all are at the forefront and the tip of the spear of American democracy, this union. So I want to thank each and every one of you all today for welcoming me here. I so deeply appreciate it. Because together, not only are we going to save this country, but we're going to transform it for the better and it is necessary, and it is needed, and we don't have to be scared of a change where people will be paid more, where we will have the right to health care, where all people will be tolerated and welcome. We don't have to be scared about transforming into a better world. There is no reason to fear it. There is all reason to fight for it. Thank you all very much. I so sincerely appreciate it today, and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your convention. Let me try.